Let me tell you a little bit about, a little bit of background. I think some of you might have been here the uh, last time I talked, which how long ago was that, Adam? Around here? I don't know. I guess it was about a year ago. And I talked a little bit about my first book, um, For Cause and for Country, which really focuses on Spring Hill and Franklin and the events here in, in Middle Tennessee are ones that um, are very near and dear to my heart. Um, I believe that what happened here in the fall of 1864 um, was extremely important to the um, overall outcome of the war. I've said for a long time that if nothing else, what unfolded, I guess you could say what did not unfold at Spring Hill, but then what played out at Franklin, um, if nothing else helped bring an end to the war. And I think really to understand this four-year war is to understand it in its entirety. Um, and Franklin was certainly one of the last great chapters of that war. And when I was working on that first book, um, you know, I went into it, I guess, with a certain amount of knowledge and you, <clears throat> you learn, you learn a lot more as you do the research. And, and for me, quite honestly, writing is an extremely painful process. The, the research is, is far more exciting than the actual writing, but it's always nice to get the project done. And as I was working on the first book, there were a number of things that I that I came to understand and realize that I didn't know before. And um, one of them that kind of captured my attention as I was, oh, I don't know, maybe halfway through the work, um, and it culminates in this third book, was the role of three regiments that fought in the federal army. Um, I just said to uh, I just said to Adam that this this particular topic is it's very focused um, and it's frankly focused on a side that in the overall um, written history of the war certainly doesn't get as much play as the southern side. And I said I think what we should do next time is we'll advertise we're going to have a talk about Nathan Bedford Forrest and we'll have a about 100 people show up, and then we'll flip the subject and we'll talk about Yankees. Um, but I, what was really interesting about these guys was not only their role, but their motivations. Um, if, if you think about the status of things in late 1864, I think it's easy to look back um, from the point of, of history and say, well, the war was going to be over in the spring of 1865. But the problem is nobody knew that in the fall of 1864. And things had become progressively and exponentially um, more bloody. In fact, I think that it could be said that the casualties of 1864 were probably as bad as uh, the casualties that 1862 or 1863 had ever witnessed. The war had become increasingly savage, um, both in the East and in the West. And so what happens in the fall of 1864 in the north is um, a massive push to try and finally, perhaps, in, as well as heading toward the fourth year of the war, put down um, the rebellion, if you will, once and for all. And that summer, in fact, in July, uh, President Lincoln called for half a million troops. And this was about the fourth or fifth such call of that size that he had made since the early part of 1862. Um, one thing I learned during the course of this, and, and I don't know if some of you might have heard of this or heard of this statistic, but it, it's certainly not one that I think is well known. There were more men in the North who turned 18 between 1861 and 1865 than the Confederacy was ever able to put in the field during the entire course of the war. And if you think about that, you might hear, uh, have heard at some point that you know the Southern armies were defeated because of lack of supplies and the logistical system wasn't uh, as good as the North and perhaps superior armament, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There is truth to all of that, but even as Shelby Foote once said, the North fought that war with one hand tied behind its back. Talking specifically about manpower. This becomes a numbers game, as great wars often do. 
and the North had an increasing um, ability as the war went on to wage a game of numbers. Um, immigrants were still flooding into the North throughout the Civil War, and there was a constant reservoir of human strength. So Lincoln makes this call for troops. And here's the way the game played. The draft was in place. But when the call for troops went out, there were new units created. And a certain part of this half a million quota would be filled by volunteers. Whatever amount short of 500,000 was not filled by volunteers, that's when the draft would kick in. And the draft at that time was largely on a state level. It was not a federal draft. It was federally mandated but controlled by the states. And so the newspapers would begin to print, the draft is coming at this time. And if you volunteered, you would get often a state or a county bounty. You might get $50, $100, which at that time was a good bit of money, especially if you were dirt poor, as most um, white rural northerners and southerners were. So you had men volunteering um, because their time had come, um, or they had perhaps not volunteered before, and their draft number, if you will, was about to come up. And I think what I found interesting was the motivations of men in this war at this particular time, you find great similarities um, with other wars. And you find men who may not have volunteered in the first or the second year, but they realize that the time is coming. And they choose to volunteer, some would choose to be drafted, but I think a lot of people come to the point where they realize it's time for me to do my duty. They might not have been among those first wave of very um, eager warriors, but they realize that their time has come. And you have to remember that in the North in the fall of 1864, there's great dissent. Let's not forget that Abraham Lincoln was concerned as late as August that he would not even be reelected because the casualties were so immense. There were more Northern soldiers who died in the Civil War than Southern soldiers. Now on a percentage basis, the South bears a much greater burden, but there were hundreds of thousands of Northern families who had lost loved ones, who loved ones who had come home badly injured or scarred internally. And the war just kept going on and on. And so the call comes and men begin to volunteer. <clears throat> the three units that I wrote about were the 44th Missouri, the 175th Ohio, and the 183rd Ohio. The 44th Missouri starts first. They began raising that unit in Missouri in August of 1864, and largely this unit was raised as part of this call to help defend Missouri, because what's going on in Missouri is a real mess. <coughs> if you are somewhat familiar with the Missouri and Kansas actions that led up to the Civil War, the old Jayhawk Wars. Missouri in 1864, to be very honest, was as bad as anything that is going on in Iraq or Afghanistan today. It was a scene of wanton brutality that I don't think any other place in the country was enduring. It was a tit-for-tat, back-and-forth, brutal guerrilla action um, versus U.S. troops and U.S. troops trying to crush what they termed an insurgency. Men like um, Bill Anderson, but perhaps more famously William Quantrill, fighting for what they believed right. Um, civilians caught up in the midst of this, and there were a lot of Missourians who were of Union sympathies who were frankly tired of this constant brutality that was raging across the countryside both day and night. And William Rosecrans was authorized to raise 10 regiments to help put down this sort of insurrection within the rebellion. One of the units would be the 44th Missouri. Most of the men who would join all three of these units were men who had never been in combat. They were not veterans. They were young men, 18, 19, 20 years old. But a lot of guys in their late 30s and early 40s, those men who had not volunteered early on, they had their own lives, many of them were married, had three, four, five, six, seven, eight children. And they felt that their responsibilities were at home. But with the war dragging on, with Missouri on fire, you begin to see these men join up. Now, while the men were mostly rookies, one thing that is 
common thread with all three units is they put commanding officers, not just the commanding officer of the regiment, but also the company commanders were all men who had some um, prior war experience. The man who commands the 44th Missouri, in fact, is a fellow named Robert Bradshaw. He's 24 years old. He'd served for two and a half years in the 25th Missouri. Bradshaw had seen extensive action, and particularly at Shiloh. He was at Shiloh, which is kind of interesting because we're almost, what, 150th anniversary here in just a few days. Bradshaw was there on the morning of April 6th as William Hardy's Confederates just steamrolled much of Grant's army. In fact, Bradshaw was just darn lucky to survive that first day because the unit he was in, the brigade he was in, was virtually overrun and obliterated. Bradshaw did survive, obviously, and begins to raise the 44th. He's a very strong Union man. He's from St. Joseph, Missouri. Um, in fact, there's a great story about Bradshaw early in the war, May of 61. And remember, Missouri just very torn between two sides. And there was a, a throng of men in May of 1861 who had decided that they were going to rip the U.S. flag down um, off of one building, and then they were going to rip it down off of another. Well, Bradshaw caught word that they'd ripped the flag off the first building, and so he ran to the next one they were going to, and almost single-handedly stands down a mob of about 100 men. He gets up on top of the building with the flag, and he said, you're going to have to kill me to get this flag. And all of a sudden, you know, pistol hammers are cocking in the crowd beneath him, and he just simply would not relent. And they let him take He said, I'll take the flag down, but you're not going to take it. So he took the flag down, and away he went, and the throng sort of dispersed. But this was the kind of man he was. He believed in the Union. And so he's raising this unit in August of 64. They would be raised in mostly northwest Missouri, rural farm country except for St. Joseph. Um, it was actually, it's interesting, northern Missouri was often much more um, Confederate aligned than southern Missouri was. In fact, that area north of the Missouri at that time was called Little Dixie. And um, it was an awful mix because you had a lot of southern sympathizers, but you also had a lot of German immigrants who tended to be very Union um, in their sympathies, and it was just a bad mix. The other two units are interesting because they're raised in two parts of Ohio relatively close to each other. Uh, the 175th is raised in south central Ohio, virtually all farm boys. Um, the only city of any, subs uh, of any size in that area was in Highland County. It was called Hillsboro, a little town of a few thousand people. And the 175th was commanded by a lieutenant colonel named Daniel McCoy. He was also 24 years old. McCoy was a three-year veteran. He had been wounded at Murfreesboro. He had been uh, wounded at Chickamauga. He had left his unit in the summer of 64 and then immediately turned around and was given commission of a new regiment. He begins to raise it. The 183rd Ohio is probably the strangest of these three regiments, and it's a mess. They mostly came out of Hamilton County, Cincinnati, mostly city boys, and probably 80% of them were German immigrants, and about half of them didn't speak a word of English. So they actually have bilingual company commanders speaking both English and German. They did not have a commanding officer until three weeks before they would be engaged at Franklin. Their commanding officer was a man named George Hogue, Hogue had served in the 126th Ohio, spent a lot of time in the East. He had been in the wilderness. He'd been in Spotsylvania. He'd spent much of the summer and fall of 1864 moving up and down the Shenandoah Valley fighting Jubal Early's men as they were attempting to combat the efforts by the likes of Sheridan and, and Custer as they were torching whatever was left in the Shenandoah. Hogue did not get his orders from the governor of Ohio to take command of this regiment until November 9th. He was sitting near Opaquan, Virginia when he got the orders. He was writing his after-action report of the Battle of Cedar Creek when he left Virginia and headed back to Ohio where he would meet his regiment. Some of the men in the 183rd Ohio had not been mustered into their unit until November 15th, 1864, two weeks before the Battle of Franklin. Now, obviously, the reason that I wrote about these three regiments was not because they were just the stories I told you. It was because of where they would end up at Franklin. 
and the combat they would endure. Although their stories of, origi uh, of, uh, of origin and creation was interesting. It was where they ended up and how they performed um, under fire for the first time. And anyone who's ever been in combat, there's always a first time. And you never forget the first time for somebody who's shooting at you and trying to kill you. So what happens is John Bell Hood begins to cause all sorts of havoc for the um, federal defense system, if you will. Sherman has begun crafting his plans for his march to the sea. George Henry Thomas is shipped back to Nashville to help organize the defense of Middle Tennessee. And everything begins to move very, very quickly. And Thomas is trying to pull in troops from wherever he can get. Sherman would, of course, eventually cut two of his corps loose, put under the command of John Schofield, and they would be shipped back here to Middle Tennessee. But Thomas was also looking for help from Missouri. The only person that Abraham Lincoln and Ulysses Grant probably disliked or mistrusted more than um, George Henry Thomas, who I think much of their problem with Thomas was he was a Virginian, and they just never seemed to quite trust him. The only person they disliked more was William Rosecrans. And Rosecrans made the fatal error of trying to deal with another Confederate invasion that fall, led by Sterling Price, and he has his own difficulties, and he's really slowing down the process of sending reinforcements from Missouri. Well, finally, Lincoln and Grant, because Sherman is pitching an absolute fit that Rosecrans isn't sending the help back to Tennessee, because Sherman knows he's out on a string. He's now cut loose into Georgia, and the help he's expecting Thomas to get from Missouri isn't on the way. Well, they finally tell Rosecrans, listen, you got to do it. Send the units. So he handpicks 10 regiments. One of them happens to be the 44th Missouri. They weren't happy. They had signed up for 12 months to defend Missouri, and now all of a sudden, before they'd ever had a chance to defend Missouri, they were being shipped to Tennessee to deal with a real Confederate army, not just guerrillas. And so they begin to move, and they end up coming through places like Paducah and down the Cumberland. And they arrive in Nashville on the night of November 27th. And by that time, right here in Columbia, things are already beginning to move on the uptick. By November 27th, the 175th Ohio has already been in Middle Tennessee for nearly five weeks. The 175th was shipped down from Ohio through Nashville and sent here to Columbia to perform garrison duty because, of course, Franklin had been the front until the fall of, eight, or until the summer, really, of 1863. And then when Rosecrans pushed Bragg south toward what would culminate in the battles of Chickamauga and Chattanooga, the front for the Federal Army was pushed further south, and Columbia becomes really the main garrison here in south middle Tennessee. So the 175th comes down here to help hold the city, if you will. About 40% of the regiment, though, was scattered along the railroad tracks. What was important about the railroad line that ran from Nashville to Decatur, Alabama, to the U.S war effort at this point. What's important about that rail line? Supplies. What Grant and Sherman had done was create a very, very creative system of supplying their armies, Sherman's army in particular. Grant, of course, was endorsing this. You had a rail line that ran from Nashville all the way to Decatur, Alabama, and then east to Chattanooga. And then Chattanooga came back up through Murfreesboro to Nashville. They turned it into a one-way supply system. All supplies came down from Nashville through Columbia, through Pulaski, to Decatur, then were shipped east to Chattanooga where they could be moved down further into Georgia. They'd run the empty cars back up the line through Murfreesboro, reload Nashville, and it was a constant one-way triangular system. But there's a problem. There are lots of Confederate cavalrymen who are doing everything they can to bust up that supply line. So, in 1863, Grenville Dodge, who would later have a long career as a railroad man out west, devised a new way of defending the rail lines because they had been cut, they'd been 
rebuilt, they've been cut, they've been rebuilt. And finally, they were like, this is ridiculous. This is a terrible waste of time and manpower. We need to figure out a way to protect this rail line. We can't protect every square inch of it, but where do the Confederates keep hitting the rail lines? At the rivers and at the creeks. It was easier to tear them down when there was nothing underneath. So they begin to build what were known as blockhouses. And Grenville Dodge created a series of almost 40 blockhouses between Nashville and Decatur. And blockhouses are simple, square, earthen features, usually with some log reinforcements and a top made of logs. They would house about 20, 25, maybe 30 men. They were positioned at every major crossing where the railroad went over a river, or a creek. Now, at the Duck River, there's not a blockhouse. There's actually a small stockade there. But they had blockhouses at places like Carter's Creek. They had blockhouses at Richland Creek, and all the way up and down the rail line. So when the 175th gets here, they send detachments of the unit south, all the way to six miles south of Pulaski. And they were manning blockhouses all the way up to Carter's Creek Station, which is not far from Spring Hill. You had elements of this brand new regiment stretched across 70 miles of the rail line. And they have no idea what's coming their way. What is about to pour out of Alabama are 33,000 Confederate soldiers. And at the head of that rebel army is Nathan Bedford Forrest Cavalry. And that's trouble. The last unit, the 183rd Ohio, they leave um, Cincinnati, the very tail end of November. They arrive at the rail yard in Nashville on the night of November 27th, the same exact night as the 44th Missouri. These two units, who have no connection to each other whatsoever, coming in from two different directions, hit the rail yard within almost moments of one another. And they all load up on the rail cars and they begin to move south, because of course this rail line is in operation. This rail line has been resupplying Schofield's army down in Pulaski for days. So they run south, but by the time that they get to Rutherford Creek, where there's a series of blockhouses as well, this is where Schofield's army is. He has pulled back from Pulaski. This has caused an immense problem for the 175th Ohio, because remember, they have been in the blockhouses all the way south to Pulaski. And as Hood's army began to move north, he began to hit one blockhouse after another. And he ended up capturing nearly four and a half companies. About 40%, 35% of the regiment was gobbled up before they ever fired a shot. As a side note, one of the more amazing photographs I have for this book was given to me by the ancestor of a man who fought in the 175th Ohio. His name was James Daniel Howard. He was one of the men captured down on Richland Creek on November 24th. He was sent to Andersonville, and he survived. Lived until, I believe, 1911. But the photograph of him was amazing. It was taken just days after he had left Andersonville. Now, I'm guessing some of you have probably seen there's several really horrific photographs of, of uh, a couple of the men who had come out of Andersonville. They were virtual skeletons. This man was not in that shape. He still had his uniform, although it was, you know, if you get the book, you'll, you'll see his uniform sort of tattered, and he looks like he's lost some weight. But what was amazing was he had his photograph taken in Jacksonville, Florida. That's where some of the men from Andersonville were sent. And there was a photographer there, and learned a little bit about him as I was writing this book. He's a virtually unknown photographer, but he had a studio in Jacksonville, and he was charging 50 cents to take photographs. And it's the only photograph like it that I have ever seen. And um, his great-grandson was able to send me that photograph. So a good part of the 175th Ohio just vanishes. And nobody in the regiment, which is now stationed here, and they've pulled in the other units, they've pulled them down from up by Carter's Creek, no one knows what's happened to the rest of the regiment. They're probably thinking the worst, but no one really knows. And so now what Schofield has, as he's sitting here in Columbia deciding what to do, is now he has three brand new regiments. He's got about 2,000 extra men, the 175th, the 183rd, and the 44th Missouri. 
And then, of course, Schofield begins to withdraw. He moves to the north side of the Duck River. Hood attempts to flank him on the 29th. He comes very close to cutting Schofield off at Spring Hill, but, of course, Schofield would escape. The 175th Ohio, I should note, is not part of the army. Remember, they were here almost six weeks before Schofield ever got here. So the only reason they moved north with Schofield's army was, to be very honest, it seemed like a good idea. There apparently were a lot of rebels coming from that way, and so they just attached themselves to the rest of the army and the way they went. The Federal Army begins to arrive in Franklin, of course, just before dawn on November 30th. The 175th Ohio, not being attached to the army, actually is not arraying itself along the defensive front there on the south edge of Franklin. They move a bit closer to town, and one of the officers said they they set up in a little corn patch down by the town square, and there they waited. The 44th Missouri and the 183rd Ohio are at the trail end of the U.S. Army. They were given the duty on the 29th and early hours of the 30th to help escort the back end of the wagon train, which is six miles long and consists of 800 wagons. So really good job you know, for the new guys. Get them doing something at least constructive. So they get to Franklin, and the Federal Army is throwing up this defensive front. But immediately it's clear you don't want these new guys on the main line. You don't want to expose the newest troops to what may be the worst combat. So they begin to create a secondary line. And I'm guessing everyone, or most everyone, has been to the Carter House. The 44th Missouri stretches through much of what is the Carter House yard where the two outbuildings are with all the bullet damage. But that unit extends significantly to the west beyond what is today the visitor center. It's a large unit. They've got about 650 men. And every man standing two foot abreast takes up a lot of space and they'd be in double rank. But the fact is they occupy a good five, 600 feet. The 183rd Ohio files in and moves out to the right of the 44th, so they're even further, way beyond where the parking lot of the uh, Carter House Visitor Center is today. And then there's the 175th, commanded by Dan McCoy, who is, you know, you, you don't know these people, but as you write about them, you get to understand a little bit about them. And McCoy must have been he must have really been something else. He, um, he'd been wounded a couple of times, and actually, there's a photograph of him. I think everybody should see it. Just, I think, the way he wears his hat is particularly funny. Look at that picture. I mean, does that look like a guy who feels pretty confident about himself? He's sort of got it on, cocked at an angle. There's a great post-war story about him, which I relate later in the book. Well, McCoy wants to get in the action. And he goes to Jacob Cox and he says, this may be the only chance I have to prove my unit's worth. Can I be placed on the line somewhere? And Cox says, sure. Place your men in reserve. So he ends up placing his men on the east side of Columbia Pike, just behind the Carter Cotton Gin. And by a war filled with episodes of good luck, bad luck, fate, circumstance. These three units from three different places with no connections end up right next to each other, standing side by side, one of them east of the road, the other two west of the road, in the secondary line of defense. And this is why I chose to write this book, because when I worked on my first book, one thing that I was very focused on, and I remember spending many hours with Bob Duncan, grilling him about one thing or another. And one thing that I wanted to show was that John Bell Hood's movement into Tennessee was not a fool's errand. And he had a legitimate chance to take Nashville. What was clear, especially early on, was there were a lot of sort of loose end sort of stories that were told about this campaign that didn't weigh against the facts. But also the federal soldiers understood that John Bell Hood and his army were a very real threat. They had spent two and a half years fighting from Nashville to Murfreesboro to Chattanooga down into 
central Georgia, and now they were being forcibly shoved north toward Nashville. And they understood that if Hood somehow could take Nashville or seriously threaten it, this war that had dragged on for so long could be dragged out even longer. And Hood did have a chance. He had a chance not to win the war, but to drag it out. And at this stage for the Confederacy, that's about what you have. You just have to try and drag it out and keep hope alive, if you will. And if understanding that, you get into Franklin and see how close Hood comes, or how close his men, to be quite fair, how close his men came to completely destroy Schofield's army. Because often forgotten in the stories of Franklin is that the Southern army breaks through right there in the middle, right near the Carter House. This isn't just, well, they attacked and then they had a lot of casualties and six generals died, and Hood was an idiot, as often was said. They almost destroyed John Schofield's army. The Southern army blew a hole in the center of the US line that was absolutely massive. As a Western theater guy, and very biased toward the Western theater, I can't stomach hearing arguments about how great Pickett's charge is when I know how great the Confederate attack was at Franklin, and how much more success was had by the Southern troops here. I have always believed that the men on both sides who fought in the Western theater were superior soldiers. The guys out east just, well, they had Lee, if you were a Confederate, and then there were a lot of guys in the Army of the Potomac. But out west, there was something about these guys from Texas and Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee, and Illinois, and Ohio, and Michigan. They were so much like each other. And God, they hated each other by this stage of the war. They just despised each other. And what the Southern Army launches that afternoon by Hood is just an incredible spectacle. And so that got me motivated on the first book. And then I thought, this is an extension. Because what Hood does, what his men do, is nearly pull off the impossible. They break the main line. They blast a huge hole. Now, for a long time, it has been just, again, casually said, that the only way that the Federal Army was able to overcome this Confederate onslaught was as the result of one man, some of you might have heard his name, Emerson Updike. Updike saved the day. Because Updike had defied orders. He had told his superior officer that he was not going to place his unit out in front of the main line, that it wouldn't do anybody any good but the enemy, which from Updike's, to be fair to him, probably a good decision. Because that advance line gets overrun, which is what also results in such a major rupture of the main line. But I knew that before Updike ever got into the action, when the Confederates broke through, and you have to think about it like this. If this is the main line, all right, and the secondary line is sort of where you all are sitting, Updike's about back where the camera's at. So when the Confederates come screaming through the middle and they blow this whole advanced line up, or the main line, who are they going to run into next? Not Updike. He's 200 yards north of the Carter House. That's two football fields. And he's got 1,500 men. You don't just move 1,500 men 200 yards lickety split. It's going to take a few minutes just to get him moving. <coughs> and I knew this from working on the first book. And then I found all of the fun information, which really showed that these men, these men, had as much to do with how the battle turned out as anyone. And lots of details, tremendous details. I probably had more fun writing this book than I did the first one. Because the first book was, you know, it's a military study. It's the whole campaign. You're dealing with Hood and Schofield and Forrest and Claiborne. You're dealing with all the names everybody knows. It didn't, I didn't have time unless I wanted to write, you know, three volumes of War and Peace that nobody would ever read. This, I was able to get down into the names of the men that nobody knows. And as I wrote, and it doesn't matter that they were federal soldiers, they just happened to be the subject of the book. It could be a book about a Confederate unit. They're just like men from any other war. They're the names no one ever remembers.
with other people, unless it's family or a few friends. They're the people that often get forgotten, the men who lay it all on the line because they had to, because they wanted to, because duty called. Someone told me once when you're in combat, there's two things you're trying to do. It's the guy next to you and you're trying not to die. That was his impression. And as I wrote this book, I thought, I wonder how many of these guys have never been in combat, watching 20,000 Confederate soldiers come at them, some of the best troops that have ever fought on this continent, or maybe anywhere, coming at them. These are, these are Pat Claiborne's men. This isn't the kind of outfit that you just toy around with. Although these guys, at least for them, they probably didn't even know it was Clyburn's men, so they had less of a chance to be terrified. The veterans were worried. But what happens as the southern troops blow through the main line, now they're already taking heavy casualties, they run into a human wall. They run into a wall of 2,000 brand new recruits in double ranks. And somehow, for the most part, these units held together and the more I researched and the more I found, I think the more it was clear they had good officers and the men were composed of good stock. Either that or it all happened so suddenly they didn't have a chance to run. But there they stood against this wall of steel and flesh, these southern soldiers who had seen everything. In the course of the combat, the commanding officer of the one 75th Ohio would be wounded. Dan McCoy would be inflicted with his third injury of the war. A shell exploded right above him and broke his clavicle. As they dragged him off the field, his men were countercharging into that area right by the Carter Gin. Brutal, ghoulish fighting. A number of stories of men recounted in here, some as young as 16 years old. I think one of the saddest stories I found was there was a, a fellow with the last name of Bogan. His name was William Bogan. He was 44 years old. 44 years old. Serving in his first battle. So I went and looked on the census record because I wanted to know a little bit more about him. And then I found two other names that were on the roster of the 175th Ohio. And I thought, oh my gosh. It's a father and his two sons. The father would die at Franklin. One of the sons would be wounded. The third son would go home. The one who was wounded didn't get home for a few months. And there were a multitude of those stories. William Bogan today lays in an unknown grave somewhere. West of the road, the 44th Missouri probably did as much as anyone to stem the Confederate breakthrough. Robert Bradshaw, the commanding officer of that unit, would be wounded seven times. I have told this story hundreds of times over the last couple of years, shot in the neck, both arms, both legs, the back, and the hip. And I don't know if that's good luck or bad luck. And there he laid for three days on this battlefield until a Franklin woman and her daughter recovered him, pulled him off the field, and took him back to their house, where he would convalesce for seven months before he went home. His unit would lose nearly a third of its strength. One of the points about the 44th Missouri that really, I think, is testament, and you don't sometimes need the quotes and the stories of the men who were there, although they're great. Sometimes you can extrapolate what was going on by looking at the numbers and looking at other facts. The casualties of the 44th Missouri were pretty evenly divided between killed, wounded, and captured. This was a unit that quite literally was a wall that the Southern Army ran into. And when the Southern troops on that sector of the field ran into them, they didn't just bounce back off of them. They got into a complete hand-to-hand -hand brawl with rifle butts, bayonets, and their bare hands. And as I begin to look at the casualties of the 44th Missouri, I begin to realize something. How does a man get killed? Well, that's an easy answer. How does he get wounded? That's an easy answer. How does a unit that was ultimately successful, have almost 35 men captured because it was hand-to-hand -hand fighting. They were literally dragging each other in one direction or the other. 
Southern troops literally getting up in their faces. Someone gets a hand on somebody, and they drag him to the rear. One of the stories that came out of the 44th Missouri was this guy named Jasper White. I had found an account during the work on my first book fellow in the 6th Tennessee named Clay Barnes had captured the flag, it was said, of the 44th Missouri. Well, as I began to do the work on this book, I found out it was a true story. Clay Barnes had captured the flag. Because I was able to find the regimental and the national flag for the 44th Missouri, except there was a problem. The regimental flag was a replacement, meaning it was replaced after Franklin. Clay Barnes had captured the flag. Jasper White was the color bearer. Jasper White would be listed as missing in action after the Battle of Franklin. But Jasper White was not killed. He was not wounded, nor was he taken prisoner. But he was missing in action until December 18th, when the Federal Army, after the Battle of Nashville, pursuing the now crushed Southern Army back through, guess who they found in Franklin? Jasper White. I don't know what happened to him, but I think Clay Barnes beat the living tar out of him to get that flag. <laughs> so he wasn't dead, and he wasn't really wounded, and he wasn't a prisoner. He probably got clocked across the face, in the head, knocked out, and was unable to be moved. And there they found him. He rejoined the regiment mid-January. No desertion charges, nothing, just rejoined the regiment. So that was a great old story with some new research, and I think I found out exactly what happened, but it also told something else about the ferocity of the combat there. The 183rd Ohio does its job on the right flank of the 44th Missouri. Its commanding officer would survive. Its second ranking officer, a fellow named Mervyn Clark, and I'll kind of wind down with this. Mervyn Clark was 17 when he joined the US Army. His parents were dead. He'd been raised by his aunt and uncle. He was from Cleveland, bright young man great photograph of him in here. He served in the 7th Ohio. By the time he was 20 years old, he was a captain. Even in the Civil War, that was pretty good when you were 20 to be a captain. He mustered out in the summer of 64, went home, asked his girlfriend to marry him. She said no. He got mad. And he went and joined the regular army. And the governor said, well, that's just silliness. We're going to give you a commission. So he becomes lieutenant colonel of the 183rd Ohio. He is 21 years old. And one of those officers that had he been older, he probably would have been brigadier general. But he was just too young. As the 44th Missouri is right there in the Carter House yard fighting for its life, Robert Bradshaw has been shot seven times. A third of the regiment has fallen apart. But Brown's Confederates would come at them 13 separate times. 13 times, men in that Missouri unit said the Confederates charged them over and over and over again. They held their ground, but with increasing loss. The 183rd holding its ground. There's a small hole punched in another section of the US line. There's a moment where another hole has been created, and who knows, if you don't react to it quickly, that hole can expand, and the enemy can take advantage of it. The right wing of the 183rd Ohio begins swinging forward from its reserve position to help plug that gap. The color bearer, Ferdinand Herrencourt, German immigrant, carrying the stars and stripes, takes a bullet in the shoulder and falls down on the ground. And Mervyn Clark is right behind him. And Mervyn Clark grabs the flag, carries it forward to the top of the breastworks, where he would be waving that flag, trying to get his men up to support the breach. And a single bullet ripped through his head. He was dead by the time he hit the ground. They buried him that night in his blanket. His aunt and uncle would recover his body about a year later and bring him home to Cleveland, where he is buried next to them today. Ferdinand Herrencourt, the color bearer, would also make it home. They took him back to Cincinnati, where he died at his parents' home. I was able to find the church records of his funeral, written in German, logged into the book, the name of the pastor, the time of the funeral, the date of his death, another man. In hundreds 
thousands who had died in that war. Now I haven't mentioned Updike because everything that I just described helped stunt the Confederate breakthrough. Updike would come up and help seal off the remaining breach, which was right around where the smokehouse and the office building are there in the yard. But you see, the hole was 200 yards wide. It extended from the gin on the east side of Columbia Pike all the way down to about where the visitor center is today. I assure you of this, Emerson Updike and his men did their duty that day as well, but they did not have enough to plug a hole that was 200 yards wide. If the 44th Missouri and the 183rd Ohio in particular had not held their ground on the west side of Columbia Pike, John Bell Hood could have swept Schofield's entire army to the river because that was where the Confederate penetration was the deepest. One other thing my father once told me, numbers don't lie. People do all the time, but numbers don't lie. Emerson Updike's brigade, Updike was, he could have been a self-promoter of the greatest kind. He loved to talk about himself. He'd have a YouTube channel if he was alive today, and he would talk about how great he was. He would expound on his men and how great they were, and they were great. One of his regiments was commanded by Douglas MacArthur's father, Arthur MacArthur, who was wounded at Franklin. Great units, but he wanted all the glory for himself and his men. And he would talk about how many flags they captured and how many Confederate prisoners they captured. Well, as it turns out, I found out how they got all the prisoners because they came in behind the new guys and they were herding the Confederate prisoners to the rear where Updike was, so he was just sort of gobbling them up. So it was sort of an inflated sort of number. You didn't actually capture them. You were just tallying them in the rear and then later took credit for them. Updike would go to his grave trying to diminish the role of these men indirectly. He would fight with Jacob Cox, who had been there and was headquartered at the Carter House throughout the day. They would fight violently with the pen for years. In fact, at one point, Updike, who was, I think, um, often more irritable than he was ever happy, but that was just his personality, would demand of Cox the honor of credit. Cox was, I think, not only a good and able general, but wanted to get the facts right and would not relent. He said, there is glory enough for all. Updike refused to accept that as an answer. And at one point, and I spent a lot of time going through Jacob Cox's papers, he was a great guy, kept everything. Updike wrote him a 16-page letter once, and I think he must have written it over the course of about an hour because it just gets progressively nastier as the letter goes on. It's too bad they hadn't been able to talk on phone, on phone, because that would have been really interesting. But the letter had to have been written a short period of time because the handwriting is progressively getting worse. His hand must have been cramping. He was writing so hard, and he was underlining, he was capitalizing words. Their entire friendship would break apart over this. The last letter that Jacob Cox ever wrote to Emerson Updike said, at the conclusion, he said, my dear Emerson, for far too many years, you have had a warped view of the Battle of Franklin. And that was how their correspondence ended. Several months later, Emerson Updike, preparing to go out with his wife and son for an afternoon in New York City with a few minutes to spend, he decided to clean his revolver and accidentally shot himself in the stomach. There was a bullet in the chamber, and he hadn't used the pistol for about a year and had forgotten it and thus he was gone. The men in these units tried for years not to get all the glory, but just to have their story told. Not so much the 183rd, and the fellow who I worked on with this, Rich, Rupp, and I are convinced because so many of them were German, they never wrote. Well, if they did, they wrote in German. So their accounts never got into the American publication. But the other two units wrote a lot. They just simply wanted their story told. They were greatly impacted by Franklin, and I think understandably so. Anyone who survived that battle, I think, carried scars with them that are almost impossible to understand. It was an exceptionally violent battle in a war that was filled um, with terrible battles. They would go their separate ways. The 44th Missouri would finish the war in Mobile Bay and would be there as one of the last Confederate bastions, Fort Blakely, fell 
the 183rd Ohio would end up in North Carolina. And when Sherman took his boys back to Washington, D.C. for the Grand March down Pennsylvania Avenue, the 183rd Ohio was left in North Carolina to do post duty, so they never even got to take part in that. The 175th Ohio came back to Columbia. I don't know that I can find this, I just thought of this. Let's see if I can find it. They were here at the very end when the war wound down. Let's see if I can find this. Let's see, three, let me try 316. I think I can find it quickly. If I can't, I'll move on. There's a great story about the day they hear that Petersburg had fallen. And I probably won't find it, I'll have to paraphrase it. They found out that Petersburg had fallen to Grant's men and, oh, here it is, April 4th, almost to the day, 1865. Yesterday was a day of great rejoicing here. Colonel McCoy sent a dispatch down, remember this is right here in Columbia, Tennessee. Colonel McCoy sent a dispatch down for all the drinking saloons to be open and for every soldier to get drunk who wanted to. And to bring the artillery on the square and fire 36 rounds at the arrival of the 10 o'clock train. Everything went along well enough until about 12 when they got to carrying on rather strong and Captain Heiston went to the Colonel and got permission to close the saloons. And by evening it was all quiet. It is generally thought the war is about over. The citizens here have long faces. But I think that for the citizens, they knew the war was ending. The federal soldiers had a sense that it was finally over and they would be home by that summer. At the end of the book, because I love baseball, I was looking for something to try and tie into the end of Robert Bradshaw's life. He lived until 1927, the colonel of the 44th, wounded seven times, carried one of the bullets in his back for the rest of his life worked as an accountant for a railroad company for many years in St. Joseph. But he died in 1927, and boy, he lived a long time. And he died, uh, it was a day in May, I don't remember exactly, it's, it's noted in here, but. I just Googled the date, and I thought, I'd, let's see if anything interesting happened on the day Bradshaw died. Well, nothing interesting happened on the day Bradshaw died, except they were playing baseball. And I thought, well, this is a great way to maybe finish up the book. On the day that Robert Bradshaw died, the Philadelphia Athletics played a doubleheader against the um, Boston Red Sox. And in the lineup that afternoon for the Philadelphia Athletics was a man I'm sure you've all heard of, Ty Cobb, who played his entire career for who? Not Philadelphia, who Ty Cobb played for. We don't have any baseball fans. The Detroit Tigers. <laughs> He played 25 years for the Tigers, but like too many sports figures, they don't know when it's over. The Tigers knew it was over, and Cobb wouldn't admit it, so he played one year for the A's, and he batted about 270, which was about 100 points lower than his career batting average. He'd be pretty good today, but not so good then. He played both games with a doubleheader, and he went two for eight. And that same afternoon, in old Yankee Stadium, Remember, this is 1927. Well, you're not baseball fans. Never mind. <laughs> One of the greatest teams that ever played Major League Baseball was the 1927 Yankees. And I am not a Yankees fan, but you have to acknowledge when good, it's good. Babe Ruth hit one of his 714 home runs into the upper deck of old Yankee Stadium against the Washington Senators who would later become my baseball team, the Minnesota Twins. So there was that sort of personal connection. <laughs> Robert Bradshaw lived so long after this war and this battle, he could have literally watched High Cobb's entire career had he been a baseball fan. He saw electricity and automobiles, he saw the First World War. But I think like a lot of men, North and South, they carry those scars for a long time too. They never really go away. They may not always be there, but they come out from time to time. So when I was finished, this was, someone asked me if, uh, a few days ago, are you gonna write again? And I said, I don't know, I don't know. I'm sure I will at some point. But this book was so much fun 
not because they were federal soldiers. That was obviously what I focused on. These are soldiers, period. They are so much like men from other eras and other places and other times who um, find themselves sometimes in bad situations. And some of them don't come home. So that is their story. Baptism of fire comes from an actual quote. The man said Franklin was our baptism of fire. And it would be the only battle in which they would fight. They would be home by the summer. In fact, the guys in the 175th were home for the 4th of July. They got home on July 3rd. And everybody else was home by July and by August. And uh, some of them lived a long, long time. Any questions? I think that's about it. Any questions about Franklin or these guys? Ready to go home? Adam, any questions? Yes. How much are your books? I'm sorry? How much are your books? Uh, the 30. Okay. Same as the other one. I'm sorry? Where did you get all that information you talked about? <laughs> <laughs> I know all the years older you are. I don't know all that. Years. That took four and a half years. Um, the, the, the truth is, um, it is either a sign of a serious mental problem <laughs> that I have, um, and that may well be it, but I really think it requires a tremendous amount of um, discipline because it's not easy. It's easy to collect material. It's not easy to put it together and then to sit down and say, what I'm going to start, I'm going to finish. And I will say, by the end of that, I was about ready for it to be done. But it just requires pounding it into your head. And the way that I do things is I look at everything. I look at the same thing seriously three to 500 times. I mean, I'll go over the same things over and over and over again. Because if I ever have to talk about it, I've met too many authors who write and then don't, if you ask them a question about their own book, they don't, they don't know the subject. But it is a lot of fun, actually. Do you do it more chronological, or do you delve more into the personalities as you go along? Or do you just Both. It's all chronological, but introducing the personalities at appropriate places. But it is literally chronological from the summer of 64 until 1927, which I think is the last bit of the book. And it's actually, the book's actually two pieces. See, it, it's, it's obviously quite large, but that's because the back of it are the casualties. These are all the casualties. What we decided to do is, well, this isn't a standard regimental history, but we wanted to list all the men, and not just say this guy was wounded or this guy was killed, but to tell you how old he was, when he signed up, where he was from, what he did, if he survived, what was his wife's name, how many children did he have, did he get a pension, when did he die, where is he buried? So the, the, the second part, it's an appendix, but it's really an extension of the narrative so that you can learn more about some of these people. And when I said that they are the names people forget, it is true. They, too many come home and, you know, if their name's not carved into a monument somewhere or they did something that a lot of people remember, there's just so many, and a lot of guys want it that way. But, you know, I think a lot, they, everyone deserves to be recognized for service like that, at least I think so. Your man that you said died at Franklin and his family came back a year later. Mervyn Clark. Well, I thought that most of the federal troops were, bodies were removed from there and taken to Murfreesboro. Murfreesboro. So where did they get him in Franklin? They got him in Franklin. That's a great question. They actually got him just before the exhumations commenced. Okay. They seem to have got him probably in about January of 60, uh, 66 because he was buried um, in March, and I have a newspaper account indicating that he was home. His body was back in Cleveland by the end of January. So, because the, having grown up up north, the ground is you know frozen solid, so you have to put, you have to store bodies. <laughs> That's the truth. 
<coughs> um, and that's, I think, what they did to them. And when were the Confederates moved to Compton? 66. Same. But federal soldiers are moved. It, it's almost uh, simultaneous. Spring of 66. Is there any reason that you know of? I mean, every other place, Gettysburg, the wilderness, everywhere, the national government took some kind of interest in, and it's become a national park, or it's become, was there such a dislike of Franklin? What's the reason that it never became? I think it was judged um, as a second tier kind of battle. It wasn't. I don't think it was. I mean, it's not Gettysburg or Vicksburg. I mean, there are, you know, those are pantheonic events. But Franklin sort of suffered the same fate that Nashville and Atlanta did. Mm -hmm. I mean, none of Atlanta was saved. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Murfreesboro was almost lost. I mean, what's, what's saved in Murfreesboro is really okay. not that substantial. Mm -hmm. The problem was that once the first wave of the national parks were created in 1893, and then there were a few in the very early 20th century, once you got beyond that and you got into World War I, the Depression, and World War II, there just wasn't, there wasn't the money, there wasn't the interest, the veterans had started to die, and it just became less and less important. There's been a, um, in the last 20 years, there's been a rebirth of interest to save what is left. Um, but for me, I can say in a selfish sort of way, I'm glad the National Park didn't get Franklin because I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing. Because no. I could never work within that godless bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you. It's a lot more fun to do it privately. <laughs> um, so, you know, there's good in all sorts of bad you can find. But there were efforts. There were, I believe, if I remember correctly, 23 separate bills introduced into the United States Congress um, in the early 20th century to make Franklin a national park. But they all died in appropriations, as, you know, many things do. They never even get out of committee. There just wasn't... Well, there was, it was a very small town. What were there, 700 people or something that were there at the time? But I, and <coughs> I was asking, you talked about Missouri. There was, I thought at one time, they got so upset between the problems between Kansas and Missouri that they made a, a dead zone across the top of Missouri and people were taken off of their their land and no one was allowed to live there. Actually, it's kind of the western strip. It's, it's called Gen yeah, it's called General Orders Number Eleven. Eleven. I knew it was Thomas Eleven. Ewing, which is um, arguably one of the most controversial things that I think ever happened, ever happened in the war. Um, and it's very difficult as a historian to thread that when you're interpreting it because it is so volatile for anyone who had family in that area. What I try to, what I try to get people to understand is that when something like that is happening, when you are an army that has moved into an area, and I know some people will try and tie it back into, well, it didn't need to happen because the war didn't need to happen. Well, that's, a, that's just a circle of argument that you'll never get around. The war did happen. When you move into an area and you may have 99% of the people not causing you any grief, but if you've got a contingent that's sniping at you, that's, that's going after you, um, at some point you have to deal with that problem. And what you'll find often, we've seen that in Iraq and Afghanistan, and, if this, and we don't play wars like we used to. In fact, I think sometimes we play too nice nowadays. And if you've got civilians who aren't giving up the bad guys and keep hiding them, you're going to have to go in there and deal with that. You, or else you just have to leave and just admit defeat. And Ewing had been having serious problems in that area. There had been some federal soldiers, some wounded ones, whose throats had been slit. Um, and it got ugly. That, it's a great example, I think, of why Walt Whitman once said the real war would never get in the books. There were some things that were going on during this war, and I, personally, I like it. I like knowing, having these things come out, because for far too long, I think the war was glorified and romanticized. And it was this, you know, chivalrous event, and these, you even see the paintings from 70 and 80 and 90 years ago, and they're like old cartoons where, you know, nobody, there's no blood and 
everybody dies a nice, you know, gallant death. It was, it was awful. It, it was simply awful. Places like Missouri, when I said it is as bad as what's going on in Iraq and Afghanistan, it, it was. It was incredibly bad. I relate a story at the beginning of this I didn't talk about, a place called Centralia, that is arguably one of the worst things I've ever researched. It is so awful what happened there, to think that human beings can do that to each other, just for sport, almost. <laughs> Um, and that sad part of that is war brings that out. You know, war brings out anybody who's a little off balance to begin with. War can bring out something in them that is incredibly dangerous. Centralia was just a scene of wanton murder and pillage that was just awful. Um, and it goes back and forth. You know, one side could say, you did it to my people, and then the other side would say, but you did it to mine, and it just went back and forth. You ended up seeing that in Shenandoah Valley by 64, when John Mosby and Phil Sheridan were hanging each other's guys, just putting them up in a tree. One here, three there, 10 here, till finally the orders went back and forth and said, okay, if you stop, I will, but if you don't, I'm not gonna. Um, terrible stuff. War is hell when you begin to enjoy it. Bill Anderson was a guy, he was at Centralia, and he was someone who had begun to enjoy it. And that's a very apt description. He was, he was someone that had there been no war, Bill Anderson might have been the guy who occasionally got into trouble and kicked the dog and who knows. But war brought something out of him that was almost sociopathic. And, and as uh, Jesse James comes out of that. And there's a great American story. We take people and make them into folk heroes because they're sort of you know, fighting against the alleged bad guy, but it's bad stuff. It's sort of like that story of what the guys did to the sons of Jack Henson. Yes, I mean, absolutely. Who would ever even dream that things like that would happen? But well, and that's where you have like barbarity Depravity leads to barbarity because yeah. what happened to his sons was totally unnecessary. And then you have a normal man who just went over the edge. Yeah. Except he had the capacity to bring it back. Once he was yeah. done, he yeah. could shut the valve off. Anderson was 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 not not like that. But some folks say the war started out in Missouri ten years before the shots were fired. I mean, watch people at a Kansas and Missouri game, basketball game, they still don't like each other. <laughs> and it's just basketball. Yeah, there's, that's where John Brown was. You know, John Brown had gone out there and he'd sworn that he was going to fight slavery, but to go out and hack people to death with machetes, yeah, yeah. you know, that's taking a little step too far. Several steps too far. Well, a lot of it started on the land grants from the wars, the Revolutionary War, the 1812 War. The grants were granted to the farmers and everybody else, the frontiersmen. They moved in on the property, and then the Indians were acting up. So the Union sent their military in the South and were killing them off and killing the livestock off, and it killed everybody off. That's way before all of it started. I've argued for years this country was destined to fight this war. I don't think there was any way to stop this war from happening. It was, by 1860, the perfect storm had come together. The right group of people who were ready to pull the trigger on secession and Lincoln. And those two forces collided and it got bad and it was, and nobody understood. Nobody knew how bad it was going to be, but it had been bubbling under the surface for, you know, quite a long time. <clears throat> Any other questions? Read about the Kansas-Nebraska Act if you want to see probably the final straw that may have broken the camel's back. Kansas-Nebraska Act. Harken back to your school days. Congressional legislation that was just tearing the country apart. It just took seven more years. My great great granddaddy was captured at the Battle of Franklin.
What unit was he in? Uh, 41st. 41st. They switched around quite a bit. 41st Tennessee? Tennessee. He was in Sumner Cunningham's he was outfit. With Pat Claiborne when he died. Oh, well, Sumner Cunningham was the um, man who edited Confederate Veteran Magazine for 20 years. There was five men standing when it was over, and he was the one of the five. Well, 41st has a lot of guys buried at Carnton. 